Three sons and four grandchildren of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniya assassinated in Gaza. Their names added to a long list of people killed by Israeli targeted operations worldwide. So why does Israel pursue such a policy? And what's its impact? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. The seven family members of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh assassinated by Israel on Wednesday in Gaza are the latest victims of Israeli-targeted killings. Israel has been doing this around the world for decades. The reputation of its overseas intelligence, our Mossad, has become part of Israeli propaganda in cinema and TV serials. A licence to kill anyone Israel considers an enemy. The niceties of international law are ignored, as are the politics or criminal repercussions of such acts. So is this tactic an official policy of Israel? And if so, what's its impact? Or is it just about vengeance? We'll put that to our guests in a moment. But first, this report from Katia lopez Hodayan. It was a targeted Israeli strike in Gaza City that assassinated three sons and four grandchildren of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniya. He says the killings will simply strengthen Palestinian determination. They believe that if they kill or assassinate leaders or their next of kin, that we will abandon our people, that we will abandon our resistance. They are mistaken. This noble blood that is spilled, including my own children, will harden our resolve, make us more defiant, more adamant to continue to march on this road the road of struggle and resistance until we win our freedom and the lawful rights of the Palestinian peoples are restored. The attack follows Israel's bombing of Iran's consulate building in the Syrian capital Damascus that killed several top Iranian officials earlier this month. Another suspected Israeli drone strike in Lebanon's capital back in January killed Saleh al oruri the founder of Hamas's armed wing. Palestinian leaders say those killed are quickly replaced. We are a resistance movement, and the resistance must be victorious. The resistance will be victorious. For decades, Israel has assassinated people in the occupied territories and abroad, Palestinian leaders and Iranian scientists among them. According to studies by Israeli author Ronan Bergman, up until 2018, Israel assassinated 2,700 people worldwide. In the past, leaders who've rallied for a two-state solution have also been targeted. Palestinian President Yasser Arafat died unexpectedly in 2004. And many suspect Israel may have been behind his death. Now, decades later, the war in Gaza has reignited past tensions and fueled new ones. Some believe the Israeli assassinations of Hania's family were intended to derail negotiations between Israel and Hamas. Bibi and I had a long discussion. U.S. President Joe Biden is pressuring Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to reach a ceasefire. But many now say Israel's continued use of assassinations will further risk the long-term prospects of peace in the region. Katia lopez Odoyan, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guest now in Tel Aviv, Ilan Babe, Professor of History at Exeter University in the UK. In Boston, Rami Khouri, Distinguished Public Policy Fellow at the Assam Faris Institute at the American University of Beirut, a columnist and analyst. And in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Colin Clark, Director of Research at the Sufyan Group, specialising in the future of terrorism, security and transnational crime. A very warm welcome to you, gentlemen, on this edition of Inside Story. Uh, Ilan Papi, can I come to you in Tel Aviv first? Uh, you know, we've got the facts there. Israel says that those that were killed yesterday were Hamas terrorists and collateral damage. The Palestinians say they were the children of Ismail Haniyeh. It's all about the narrative, isn't it? And the message getting out to the international audience. Yes, uh, thank you for having me in, in your program. Uh, yes, I think it is, it is about uh, the narrative. And it's also about uh, how detailed uh, a lie uh, can be. 
part of the Israeli narrative, I don't know if this came out in English, but definitely in Hebrew, was that this was a decision taken by a very junior officer uh, who took the decision uh, in a, a blink of a moment uh, because of the uh, uh, intelligence that he received, which I think is a lie. I think Israel knew exactly who they targeted. They knew these were the, uh, the, the sons of Ismail Haniyeh. I do think also that they knew that there were grandchildren there but didn't care. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it's, it's not just a matter of one narrative against the other. It, it's really a, a fabricated kind of an explanation for something that, uh, you know, the pictures themselves tell the story in a very clear way. But I do agree. Uh, if I may just add something, uh, uh, although there might be an immediate uh, reason for this, as, as your reporter has men, uh, mentioned, you know, that uh, Netanyahu wanted this act in order to derail uh, the negotiation, which is definitely a feasible and probable explanation. One should remember that the Zionist movement, even before the creation of the State of Israel, uh, targeted Palestinian uh, uh, political elites, cultural elites, uh, out of this kind of Orientalist belief that if you hit the elites or the leaderships, you have an easier uh, way of or easier time in oppressing and repressing mm. uh, the people you want to colonize, okay. ethnically cleanse, or uh, or imprison in big uh, prisons as they did in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Sure. So I think there's also an historical structure here and probably also more immediate uh, uh, reasons, and I'm sure we'll talk about them a bit later. Indeed, we will, we will uh, unpick this as we go along, uh, hopefully, uh, quite deeply. I just want to get to Rami Khoury about this, because the impact of such an assassination, however you want to describe it, assassination, targeted killing, it, it, it has an impact, it surprises and it shocks. That's what the Israelis want. It's what the reaction might be from the Palestinians in the short term and the long term to this. Well, the Israelis have uh, shown clearly since the pre-state Zionist days, um, really the last century, they're very good at killing Palestinians. They're very good at ethnic cleansing, uh, expanding colonial settlements, cajoling Western imperial powers to helping them set up their settler colonial apartheid state. They're not very good at understanding the realities of how people in Palestine and Arab countries actually behave as human beings. Uh, and they behave actually exactly the same as Jews and Israelis behave. That if you're subjugated or tortured or uh, deported or de humiliated, you react with resistance. You fight back. You may not fight back immediately, but you fight back. The, the whole growth of Hamas, Hezbollah, now Ansarullah and Yemen and others, this uh, phenomenon of the last 40 years uh, has profoundly changed the landscape of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the mm. regional uh, uh, picture. And the Israelis and uh, the Americans with them, I think, don't understand uh, that these the people are willing to fight. They know they're going to get killed. They don't uh, shy from uh, taking actions or making statements uh, against Israel. Um, and the Israelis just keep... Sure. practicing their same policy of trying to kill leaders without any real impact because the Arabs, the Hamas, the Hezbollah and others are prepared for this and there are lines of succession that are very, uh, very clear. Uh, so this is a, a, a real problem uh, for the Israelis, how, how to come up with a better policy uh, than the failed one that they continue to uh, use now. And we'll talk about those lines of succession as well in the programme. Colin, can I come to you in, in Pittsburgh? I mean, targeted killings are justifiable from the Israeli point of view. Uh, they've been going on for decades, not just in the occupied territories, as, as our report did say. But why has this specific Israeli policy that's been running for quite a long time, and is very evident and obvious, allowed to continue in the international domain without any obvious sanction from the US, from Europe in general? Yeah, well, I mean, it would be difficult for the United States to say much credibly, given uh, the way the United States has, uh, you know, engaged in the global war on terrorism. I, I think, you know, uh, basically setting a precedent uh, for targeted assassinations uh, of terrorists without uh, due process, without trial. You know, but this goes far beyond the United States. This is something that the Israelis have uh, touted as uh, an effective counterterrorism tool. 
Uh, there's been many books, many studies written on, uh, you know, targeted assassinations as uh, a counterterrorism policy. And, and so uh, what we haven't seen is targeted assassinations bring success. Often it's the opposite. They're removing leaders, uh, and in the process, up through the ranks come even more battle-hardened, more extreme uh, leaders. Uh, they're eliminating people that they could probably do business with. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest looking at the case of Northern Ireland, where, uh, you know, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness were labeled terrorists by the British, but ultimately those are the people that delivered peace. Indeed. Uh, Rami Khoury, let me bring you in again with, with Colin here, uh, that if Russia does this, and we've seen this quite openly in the last few years, such as uh, the poisoning of Litvinenko in 2006, Sergei Skripal in 2010, George Markov, the, the very famous poisoned umbrella incident in 1978 on Waterloo Bridge, there's a lot more as well, there were sanctions galore on Russia, Colin. Israel does it in the name of self-defence or post-Holocaust revenge or terrorism. No one bats an eyelid. Yeah, so this is something that uh, the United States has, has failed consistently to bring pressure on, on the Israelis, uh, you know, with regard to the way they conduct counterterrorism. The Biden administration has probably brought in more pressure than, than some previous administrations. But even there, and especially in election year, uh, you're, you're reaching kind of the maximum amount of, of pressure you're likely to see. I think the Biden administration has mishandled this conflict in many ways. Uh, but there's a big growing rift between Biden and Netanyahu, and it's one that's likely to get worse before it gets better. Rabbi, can I bring you in on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, there, there's a kind of standard, um, double standard or hypocrisy or imperial behavior that big powers uh, use, the British, American, Russians, uh, all over the world, that they're allowed to break the law, they're allowed to kill uh, with abandon, but other people cannot do that and must be uh, held accountable in front of some kind of court or uh, possibly sanction. This is how imperialism works. And this is what the Zionists successfully uh, played on uh, starting in, you know, 1910 or so. They got the British the power of the day to support them in creating a Jewish homeland and, a, and an Israeli state and a land that was 93 percent Palestinian Arab. And then the Americans after World War II became the big imperial Western power. And that's where Israel has focused uh, its uh, lobbying and pressure. Mm. They still have immense, Israel still has immense pressure uh, uh, on the White House, uh, much of Congress and some state uh, legislatures in the U.S. and every other dimension of American politics, the ability of Israel to expect complete support has, has frayed badly and is fraying quickly in campuses, in labor unions, in media, uh, all kinds of uh, the churches, other institutions. But you still have the White House pretty much giving Israel everything it wants, even though, as Colin said, there is now verbal uh, um, scolding. Um, uh, but the verbal scolding from the White House is paired with uh, massive new weapons transfers and uh, financial aid and no real uh, diplomatic uh, pressure at all. So we have to judge people by what they do. But what the Americans do is basically say, keep killing, uh, we're going to be with you. Uh, Ilan Pape in Tel Aviv, can I just get your opinion on certainly what the answers that we've just had, but about this policy of targeted killing? I mean, through the years and the decades uh, since the, the establishment of Israel, the narrative of how you describe in Israel Palestinians or Arabs must have changed, especially when we had incidents such as the Oslo Accords, peace with Egypt. You know, not everybody was the enemy. Now, how is it perceived? Yeah, first of all, uh, just to agree with the, the other two guests, I've just finished a book called Lobbying for Zionism uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, and it's very clear that both in Britain and in the United States, uh, the lobby is uh, uh, more than 100 years old and, and therefore works by inertia. There's no need to tell Biden what to say when it comes to uh, uh, not uh, scolding Israel for its uh, uh, policy of killing. And, and therefore, the, it will take quite a, a while before this kind of impact on um, the American uh, political decision making would change. Although, as, as I think uh, Rami mentioned, the civil society has already changed. And therefore, I think we should be more optimistic about uh, future changes in American policy, but not in the immediate future. Now, uh, uh, for your question, I, I, I do think that the exception is the dehumanization of the Palestinians. 
uh, I'm sorry, the rule, the rule is the dehumanization of the Palestinians, and the exceptions are the moments where you get the impression that maybe uh, Palestinians are treated in a different way. But I think all in all, in the 120 years of the presence of Zionism in historical Palestine, the Palestinians were dehumanized. And dehumanization is a very important part of a settler colonial project such as Zionism, because settler colonial projects are projects of displacement and replacement. And you cannot massively ethnically cleanse people or genocide them as you do now if you don't dehumanize them. And therefore, that means that not only men are targeted, but also babies and, and women. Mm. And, and this was uh, the kind of Israeli major perception of Palestinians. Now, in moments such as the one that unfolded after the 7th of October, this kind of dehumanization of the, takes a, even a more extreme uh, form in the way that people allow themselves to say things uh, a, a, of a genocidal nature that maybe uh, uh, during more relaxed or calm periods that they are hiding. But mm -hmm. I think all in all, uh, in order to implement the idea that historical Palestine should be a Jewish state, you had to dehumanize the native indigenous people of Palestine. Otherwise, yes. uh, the moral basis of the whole project would have been exposed. And, and I think that... Uh, uh, the Israeli educational system, the cultural system, the socialization processes uh, in the Israeli army, all kind of create one a cohort of graduates after the other that I'm afraid would continue to see the Palestinians as subhumans, uh, as potential terrorists. <laughs> Let and, me just get in there as well. Deserve everything that comes uh, 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 in their direction. Yeah, we want to bounce. We want to bounce the conversation around because you know, again, as you say, it comes around to that whole uh, issue of silencing your critics. Uh, Colin Clark in, in Pittsburgh. Just some examples here about the way Israel's policy to silence its critics or get rid of them works. And just for our viewers, in 1979, Ali Hassan Salame was the PLO leader behind the uh, attacks on Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics, was killed in a remote control bomb in Beirut. In 2004, Sheikh Yassin, the founder of Hamas, killed again by uh, a US Apache Hellfire missiles in Gaza City. In 1981, however, in Sao Paulo in Brazil, we have Jose Alberto Albano de Amarente, a Brazilian Air Force lieutenant, who is killed, according to the facts that we have at the moment, radioactive poisoning, because he, Mossad agents and Israel didn't want Brazil becoming a nuclear power. You have the very loud, brash attacks on, on people in your neighbourhood, but further afield, away from Israel, on a different continent, you want to do it a little bit more quietly. It's all about keeping faith or keeping good relations with your allies. Yeah, and this is a global campaign, right? This is transnational and it has been for decades. But uh, even with all of the examples that you point to, and I could point to several others, uh, actually, uh, what has it done to counter Hamas? Nothing. This is an organization that has actually grown more powerful over the years. So, uh, you know, targeted assassinations are a tactic. But if they're divorced from a strategy, and I would argue a political strategy, you're going to end up in a situation like the Israelis are in now, where they've had uh, a military campaign totally divorced from any viable political strategy, uh, and it's likely to, do, to, to basically kick the can down the road. We're going to be back in the same situation in a year, 18 months, two years. Uh, but actually, you're going to have a younger generation of Palestinians that are even more enraged than the previous generation because of what they've just lived through. Uh, Rabbi Khoury, very uh, again, briefly, I would say, because we want to bounce through this conversation, the policy has changed, hasn't it, from the 1950s, where the Israelis would use these sorts of targeted killings as a last resort, a last clinical method? Yes, I think so. They, they, the Israeli Supreme Court uh, formally approved targeted assassinations. Um, so this is a policy that has the support of the highest levels of the law in uh, in Israel, and therefore they just do it uh, at rent as much as they want. They kill uh, as they're doing in Gaza now, and they don't get any real accountability uh, or pressure to stop. But but as Colin said, they're, they're not really succeeding. And if you look at the trend in the last 40 years, the people fighting back against Israel, uh, some governments, some 
uh, armed uh, non-state actors are much more sophisticated technologically, militarily. They're uh, doing things that were never uh, possible 20, 30 years ago. Israel is much more vulnerable. Um, and uh, there, there's really a huge need to reassess the entire Israeli approach to engaging with or addressing uh, the, the Palestinian challenge. And, uh, you know, when Palestine 47, 48 happened, uh, there was a one and a half million Palestinians. There's now 13 million of them. Most of them are still within 100 miles radius of uh, Palestine and Israel. They're not going anywhere. Uh, they want a peaceful resolution. Uh, but the Israelis don't want a peaceful resolution. They want the Jewish super state in Palestine and Israel that uh, that acts as the uh, external arm uh, of Western imperial powers. And West, there are enough Western imperial powers who want to do this. And therefore, we have this continuing uh, situation, which is a catastrophe uh, for everybody. Uh, uh, Ilan Pape in Tel Aviv, can I just ask how the Palestinian uprisings of the Intifada actually impacted on the way that Israeli policy changed when it comes to dealing with the Palestinians in, you might say, pre-Intifada, to post intifada, well, I think the Israeli uh, uh, government or the Israeli government, uh, immediately after the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, took a strategic decision that, on the one hand, it will continue to control the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but will never really fully withdraw from it, uh, but might rule it either directly or indirectly. That was one decision, and the second decision is that if the Palestinian would resist this Israeli strategy, Israel would react with all its might. Uh, if you want, they, they offer two models of a prison, an open prison, if uh, the Palestinians behaved well, namely, would not resort to an uprising, and a, a maximum security prison, if they did react with collective punishment that we all are familiar with, uh, demolition of houses, mass arrests without uh, a trial, uh, ex uh, expulsions, and, and indeed uh, uh, summary executions and killings. So, so I think uh, this has not changed, although Israeli governments have changed, and maybe the tactics have changed. The basic Israeli uh, uh, strategy is to continue, if I may just end the sure. sentence, uh, 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 to police. The Israeli army is a police force. It polices uh, not only the army. Hundreds of thousands of Israeli are involved in daily maintenance and policing the two prisons that they've created, one in the West yeah. Bank and the big so, prison that has uh, um, revolted in Gaza. And, 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 and this is and, the and I'm gonna just chip in. I, I am going to chip in there, because I think we're just going slightly off topic here, because, again, we, you know, we, we're focused on this, on this, on this issue of targeted killings, and, and you talk about the general perception of, of certainly how uh, the Palestinians are treated, but how does the Israeli public, the Israeli diaspora, listening on radio, watching television news programmes, react to the narrative that is a targeted killing right now? Yes, but I think, you you know, you cannot separate uh, uh, the killings from the strategy and the ideology. In this, I, I, I disagree a little bit with Rami and the other guests, because I do think this is the strategy. It's a horrific strategy, but it is a strategy with the hope that one day that can they can really make uh, the whole of Palestine a Jewish state. Now, as, as far as the Israeli uh, public uh, is concerned, it has the full support of the Israeli Jewish electorate. And, and, and that's why I think you have to connect it to the way uh, uh, the Jewish public is educated, indoctrinated, to dehumanize the Palestinians. This is seen as actually a work of the elite. Uh, 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 part of the Israeli army. This is the height. And look at the situation now. There is no okay. picture of triumph in Gaza. There is a hope that the Israeli public would see the killing of the three children of Haniye okay. as at least equivalent to a, a picture of victory because they have totally failed uh, in, in that operation that they have started on the 8th of October. OK, I'm, 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 I'm going to stop you there, if you don't mind, Ella, and just uh, pop over to Colin uh, in, in Pittsburgh, because I just wonder what the strategy will be now, because we've seen targeted killings in Lebanon in, in the past few months as well. Uh, we're seeing a ratcheting up of violence from Israel, though they haven't admitted it, but we, we know generally commentators believe they are behind, obviously, the, the bombing of the Iranian consulate office in, in Damascus. It is ratcheting up in a way that the global uh, politique do not want, and it's worrying America. 
Well, the cynic in me would say that this is a deliberate ploy uh, by you know Netanyahu and his cronies to deflect attention away from Gaza, uh, and which is a, a conflict that's not going well for the IDF, and to broaden the conflict to drag in Iran and namely to drag in the United States uh, as a way of kind of saying, look, this isn't just an Israeli thing. This is a regional issue. And I'd argue we're in a low boil regional civil uh, regional war now uh, when you consider what's going on uh, in Lebanon, in Yemen, uh, in Iraq, uh, that, that ebbs and flows. And so I think that's the goal of Netanyahu is to paint this as something broader uh, and to take the focus away from Gaza. Because again, uh, when you're killing, you know, uh, the kids and grandkids of political uh, Hamas political members, uh, that means that you aren't able to achieve your goals. And so you're you're kind of reaching. They're looking for tactical victories, right? Marwan Issa is the highest ranking Hamas member uh, that, that's been killed so far. Uh, the Israelis have very few tactical victories to point to, and they have 33,000 civilian deaths that the world is asking why. Right. Uh, Rami, very quickly then, let, let me just come in here. Are the Israelis running out of ideas when it comes to targeted killing and therefore these um, over-the-border incidents are a way of deflecting perhaps the, the lack of, I don't want to say imagination, but the, the lack of direction that, uh, 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 that the Israeli military or politique have right now? Yeah, there's two dimensions to this. One is that the Israelis are still trying to defeat Hamas, which they're not going to be able to do no more than they could defeat Hezbollah or others. They're, they're trying that with massive killings and destruction. The other part of this is relates to what Ilan said about the ideology of Zionism for the last 120 years. I've just finished a, a little study of uh, Israeli propaganda points, uh, which I'm going to publish next week, analyzing what they've been saying for the last hundred years and the last 55 years in which I've engaged in debates with Israelis and pro-Israeli people in the West. And, and this shows that Israel has consistently said that it wants to state for the Jewish people, but it's parallel with its uh, self uh, image as a bastion of Western democracy, humanism, enlightenment, and uh, good life. And they want to bring this to the uh, uh, uncivilized Arabs. And so they see this confrontation as not just with Palestine, but with Iran and with Syria and with other people in the region. And they desperately want the United States to fight that battle for them. But the United States is pretty irresponsible, but not quite to the extent that they're going to get into a war with Hezbollah uh, and Iran. So Israel, uh, Israel is in what the political scientists call a real pickle. Uh, they don't quite know what to do, and all they can do is keep killing and keep telling lies and exaggerations. And uh, this is what we're going to okay. keep seeing. Indeed. Sadly, we have to leave it there. There is so much more that I wanted to ask, but I'm sure we'll be coming back to this subject with you gentlemen again here on Inside Story. I'd like to thank you so much for joining me, Elan Pape, Rami Khoury and Colin Clark. Thanks so much for your time, gentlemen. And thank you as well for watching as well. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and all of the team here on Inside Story, thanks very much for your time and your company.